Good morning, everybody. We have been sorting some uh, technical difficulties this morning, and I'm hearing from some of you that you were able to spy on us audibly. So that's kind of hilarious to me. It actually makes me happy. I love, I love thinking of you being here with us right now. And you are. You were. My name is Jen Throness. It is my joy and privilege to get to be with you today to talk all about the gloriously beautiful book of Zephaniah. Before we go any further, though, why not um, bow your heads together with me and let's pray. Father, the more years you allow us to study your word together, the more we grow to understand the beauty of your word. There was a day where I didn't really understand what the psalmist meant when he said, your word is like honey on my lips. But I feel in tiny dribs and drabs, bit by bit, you allow me to understand the sweetness of your word. It is as honey on our lips. God, you are so good and so kind and so beautiful and so much more and better and higher than any good thing we can conceive of. I pray, Father, that you would be glorified today through this lesson. I pray that your name alone would be high and lifted up. Would you grant it to us, your daughters, to know our Lord Jesus better today through the pages of Zephaniah? Would you allow us to be beautified through your word, the washing of your word, as we read about in Ephesians? Would you wash us cleaner through Zephaniah? Would you work in each of us that which is pleasing in your sight because we so long to glorify you and live our lives in a sacrifice of praise and thankfulness to you. May it be so this morning, Lord God. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So when was the last time you sang a song in church about the future judgment of the world? We're not really into that, are we? Such a downer. It's not super seeker sensitive. Not very name it and claim it. A direct violation, really, of the so-called law of attraction. We love to sing songs that keep it positive. But did you know that godly people of a bygone era used to take God's judgment of the world so seriously as even to sing songs about it. A famous medieval Latin hymn was based on Zephaniah 115. Listen to the first two verses of it. Day of wrath, O day of mourning, see fulfilled the prophet's warning. Heaven and earth in ashes burning, what fear man's bosom rendeth. When from heaven the judge descendeth, on whose sentence all dependeth. That doesn't sound very much like a love song, does it? Which reminds me to point out to you today that the title of my lesson is Love Songs. I wonder how popular a worship leader would be if he selected that particular hymn today. So today it's my goal with you to do three things together. We're first going to do a bird's eye swoopy flyover over the book of Zephaniah. And then we're going to talk about the love of God. And then even more specifically about love songs. Three points for you dear note takers. Bird's eye swoopy flyover of the book of Zephaniah. The love of God and love songs. So I'm fascinated personally to note that Zephaniah and Jeremiah were contemporaries. So if the scripture you studied this week sticks fast to your heart, go read some Jeremiah to further your understanding. I know I definitely plan to. I know that some of you this week thought that only one paltry week spent in Zephaniah just wasn't nearly enough, and I'm with you. So go do a deep dive maybe in Jeremiah chapters 30 to 30, 32 for starters, if you're longing for more. 
Politically, the times were in ferment. Sound familiar? Assyria was losing its power. This uh, other sort of foreign to us people group called the Scythians were now invading from the north. And Babylon was just now becoming the preeminent superpower. We know now that King Manasseh had led the people of Judah deeper and deeper into idolatry and the adoption of foreign worldly ideas and customs. And Josiah will seek to reverse this trend. More on this later, spoiler alert, but King Josiah dies in the battlefield before his good work can be finished. And his successors on the throne allow the people of Judah to rush headlong back into their evil ways. Evil swirls all around God's holy remnant. Chaos looked as though it rained. Perhaps we know today a little of how they felt. Let's watch these people closely to see the lessons we can superimpose onto our own crazed times. So our minor prophet this week traces his ancestry back to King Hezekiah. So he is a royal who would have been able probably to gain a hearing among the elite of his day. And his day was probably sometime during the reign of good King Josiah, which was between 640 and 609 BC for you history buffs. When the feared empire of Assyria was in decline and the Babylonians were still gaining power. The national judgment foreseen by Habakkuk had not yet materialized. Maybe the officials of Judah thought the worst was over. I think it would have been easy for them to lapse into reassuring routine and think, eh, the Lord will do nothing, neither good nor bad. Complacency. This is a word that jumped out from our text this week. I'll be fine. Just chill. It's all good. Perhaps this prophet who belonged to the royal line would give his elite buddies welcome news of coming blessings in spite of their refusal to promote the pathway toward the abundant life that the Lord had graciously communicated to them. If this is what they were thinking, If this is what they were expecting, then they could not have been more wrong. I think by now we can see clearly that a pretty dominant theme running through the book of Zephaniah is that God announces to Judah the approaching day of the Lord. That great day is coming, and God tells Judah about it. 1 Peter 4.17 tells us that God's judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So if these court officials were expecting a message about coming blessings, it wouldn't take long for their minds to be blown as they listened to Zephaniah's prophecy. In the very first sentence, Zephaniah lets them know what God had planned for them. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord of hosts. And so noble birth or position would be no protection. The so-called people of God had ignored God for too long. We don't just get to call ourselves children of God and then do whatever we like, safe and secure for all of eternity. We don't just get to slap on the moniker Christian and be done with it. You remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees who thought that their lineage made them exempt from judgment in Luke 3, verse 8? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Who your earthly father is can't save you. Only your heavenly father can save you. I think it can be really tempting to try to place God inside of a box, nice and neat, 
manageable and good as a co-pilot or a learned teacher or an add-on to one's largely autonomous life. But here in Zephaniah, we learn that on the day that was coming, the Judeans would be unable to ignore him any longer. He would cause them to experience the darkness, the gloom, the clouds, and the blackness that were the inevitable consequence of their rejection of his wonderful light. The kingdom of Judah, God's unfaithful wife, who we learned recently via the book of Hosea, is essentially just named Gomer, would be thrown on the brush pile together with all the other nations to be consumed by the fire of God's wrath. And the only ones who would be able to survive the backdraft of God's firestorm of judgment would be those who trust in the name of the Lord. There is but one safe place. Another word that jumped out at me as I studied this week is seek. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do his just commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Aren't you glad he says seek and that he doesn't say master or authoritatively arrive at righteousness and humility? He says seek them. Humble yourself on purpose, friend. Take every single opportunity to choose humbling. A little example from my own life came to mind this week. I am, and especially in the past, have been a hideously proud woman. A hideously proud runner, although I've never been all that great at it, astonishingly, when you consider my heart's attitude. I remember as a younger runner, I would be running alone at the side of the road, not, no eyes to watch me, and I would be running at a perfectly reasonable, lovely pace, just oblivious and able to really enjoy my run. And then a person would come by. Maybe another runner would approach me or a car would drive by. And then, girls, my form would get better. My cadence would pick up. My speed would improve because of the fear of man because I was trying to impress these strangers around me who probably didn't even notice me. I've learned a lot from the Lord over the years through the metaphor of running. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and what? He will lift you up. Now sometimes, because the Holy Spirit in me grows louder and louder, praise him. When I'm running, I'll see an athletically gifted woman on the side of the road running toward me, and he'll prompt me to walk, take a water break, on purpose. It's so much better. I don't know if any of this resonates with you. I don't know if you were ugly with pride in the way that I am and have been. But I want to encourage you, humble yourself on purpose whenever you get the opportunity, and freedom comes. Maybe the most astounding of all the statements that I learned this week in the book of Zephaniah is Zephaniah 2, 3. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. That is a truly stunning thing to get to read. I've been privileged to get to study Precepts' four-part series, I think it's a four-part ser series, on the book of Revelation. And somehow, I've always missed this great truth before Zephaniah. The giant question always loomed for me as I thought about and studied the day of the Lord. Where is his holy remnant? There are other Bible teachers who will authoritatively tell you one way or the other, but I could never find the definitive answer for myself in Scripture before this week. Where is the holy remnant in the greatest of all tribulations there ever was in human history? Perhaps we may be hidden on the day of his anger. But this phrasing allows no room for presumption, does it? The answer is still not definitive. Perhaps. Contingent on what? His mercy 
his kindness, his grace, his son and our Lord God, Jesus Christ. There is only one hiding place. One of the most precious things I learned this week was that the name Zephaniah means Jehovah hides or Jehovah protects. What comfort does this give you? What mental picture do you have of this hiding place or protection? Be humble on purpose and seek refuge in the name above all names because you need to remember and I need to remember only the sick know their need of the great physician. Know your need, lowly girl. So God had shown his people where life was to be found. His people could know rich, full, dynamic human life if only they would value and enjoy their relationship with their wonderful God. He has clearly provided us with the map to human flourishing. What is this so-called map? It is the Bible. It is the Word of God. This book is literally life or death. Who will you bravely invite to study it alongside with you next year, starting in September. Start asking the Lord about it now, today. But what do the Judeans do? What do we do? They put their trust in other things instead of in God. They ignored correction, and they felt no shame for doing so. Even their religious officials, who were the people who really, really, really should have known better, had turned away from God along with everyone else, did they know their God's word? There was one storm shelter where refuge could be found, one place where the fire of divine judgment would not reach them, and that place was the fire break of trust in God. And the judgment that would come in 586 BC pointed toward a final judgment that is just as certainly coming, my sisters. Remember how we learned that so often these Old Testament prophecies have multiple fulfillments on their horizon? A little bit of shoddy alliteration helps my brain remember this. Immediate fulfillment, impending fulfillment, and ultimate fulfillment. This is not a formula, but the knowledge of it can really help us as Bible readers seeking to read his word well. And in the case of Zephaniah's prophecy, there is certainly an immediate fulfillment. We know now through the gifts of the annals of history and of the whole counsel of God that very soon the very literal army of Babylon would be the bringers of Judah's immediate day of the Lord. But we can also see that this relatively minor day of the Lord points forward to the giant one, culminating human history as we know it. And when the one who will provide, sorry, preside over that final judgment became flesh, his message echoed Zephaniah's message. And you know who I'm talking about, our Lord Jesus. He is God's yes and amen to everything. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says that all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Preparing for the coming of the judge of heaven and earth, John the Baptist called for repentance in order to escape the coming wrath. We read about it in Matthew 3, 7. John made the choice clear. Put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, and escape judgment and enjoy life, or reject his payment for your sin and insist upon trying to pay for it yourself. And in John's words, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The gospel is God making a way to save us from himself. Justice demands that sin be punished, but the Son himself credits his own unmerited punishment to the account of everyone who has faith in him. Those who reject him are refusing their immunity from prosecution on the day of judgment. 
For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Acts 17.31 goes on to say he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. I cannot bear the weight of his wrath. So the Son of Man is coming to judge, and your only hope and my only hope is to hide in him. Those who have faith in him will be sheltered on the day of judgment. Jesus encourages us to choose life and escape the judgment and death that lurk outside the borders of our relationship with him. John 5, 24 says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death into life. Immigration from the land of darkness to the kingdom of light requires only faith in Jesus. The steep price for your new life in this new kingdom has already been paid by Jesus himself. It cost everything, but it is free to the likes of you and the likes of me. Do you look forward to the day of the Lord's return or do you fear it? What might be causing your fear? Do you want God to remove sin from the world? Or do you want just a little more time to play around with it for a little bit longer? What makes sinful behavior attractive to you? In what will you take confidence in this coming day of judgment that is sure? How is your relationship with Jesus? Is it growing deeper or are you drifting? What's causing this? No doubt it was surprising for Zephaniah's hearers to learn that God's judgment would include some of them too. Maybe they said something like, wait a second. We get that God would judge the other nations, but not us. We're the people of God. Ancestry, inheritance, church attendance, tuitions to Christian schools, positions, titles, these things will not protect us from divine judgment. And there is only one thing that can, a relationship with him. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? And if not, ask him. Ask him to let you know him. Ask. I don't know if you know this about me yet or not. But of all of God's magnificent attributes that I love to teach on, his love seems to be the one that I focus on least frequently. Why? Because it seems to me that Western Christian subculture defaults often to overemphasizing it, even to the exclusion sometimes of his other holy attributes. There is an, even a song circulating in our subculture deeply theologically inaccurate, called Your Love and Love Alone. There are lots more very much like it. But Tim Keller calls this taking of one or a few of our favorite attributes of God, making a graven image, a direct violation of commandment number two. It's like all the truths about God are sometimes just more than we mere humans can take in. It's maybe like a video we watch that includes just too much stimuli for us to be able to process with any semblance of sense. But we cannot presume to try to take a still photo of our God, freezing him in time and space according to our own preferences, getting him at our favorite angle, so to speak. This gives us only a partial and therefore very dangerously inaccurate view of our God. We are to take him as he is. And we need, therefore, the whole video of God, so to speak, even if we don't understand it much of the time. His word is also sometimes like this video, to use but a, but a very imperfect metaphor. His spirit is the one who will help us watch that video and make the sense of it. He is our helper, and we know by now that we are foolish to try to make 
sense of his word without his direct help, without his kind intervention. And you've learned by now, Precept Girl, haven't you, that you must always begin your study of God's word with prayer first, with the self-abasing habit of asking the Holy Spirit for his help. We run the risk of utterly wasting our time or worse otherwise. So we watch him carefully under all sorts of circumstances and we change and contort ourselves to match with him and never, never, never the other way around. That's just a fashioning of a false god of our own devising. That's just like doing what the Athenians did in Acts chapter 17. These people thought of themselves as being very religious, probably very spiritual. So much so that they made an altar with an inscription to the unknown God. They hedged all their bets. Paul knew how meaningless this was and so ministered to them, teaching them all about the character of the one true God. And this is what Paul said. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And so because I want us to truly know our God and not go along with Western Christianity's dangerous propensity to call God love and love alone, and I want us to not worship a false god of our own foolish, maybe even devilish devising. I tend not to emphasize his love all that often. But you know what? Shame on me. This, wor this week it occurred to me. Shame on me. This is not for me to do. And so this week, I want us to languish delightedly there, in this attribute of our holy, transcendent God. He is eminently loving. Blessed be the name of the Lord that he is not an unknown God. He condescends to let us know him. This God of ours is not just loving, but he is the very source of love in the universe. 1 John 4 teaches us that our God is love. So let's talk all about the giant, great, joyful love of our God. Zephaniah introduces the topic for us so beautifully. We can even go so far as to say that Zephaniah pictures our Lord singing a joyful love song over us. I hesitate to say things like this because I'm loath to put words in God's holy mouth, maligning and misrepresenting him. But guys, that is what Zephaniah says. What's amazing is that this is a God who the Bible tells us has measured the universe with the breadth of his hand. This is a God the Bible tells us the planets are like specks of dust on the scales, and yet God has done something so that the brokenness of one tiny little creature here on earth, on this tiny little speck of dust, can go into the heart of God like a shaft. How could that be? Psalm 116.2 says that he bends down to listen to you. Glorious, impossible, true thing. There aren't enough exclamation marks. He made a way so that a nothing like me can come joyfully and with complete freedom to an everything like him. The most expensive, costly way there ever was. And I wouldn't dare to say what I'm about to say next unless I had read much smarter theologians who say this same thing. He sets his love on us. And when he does that, 
He has voluntarily bound up his joy with our joy. Or I'll put it another way. God has so bound his heart to us that he will not experience unmixed joy again until we stand before him, pure and happy and joyful and glorious ourselves. His joy somehow, mysteriously, impossibly, is bound up with our joy. He has become that vulnerable to us. He has identified with us to the degree that it is truly shocking. Picture in your mind the longing, loving father of Luke 15, throwing his Middle Eastern masculine dignity aside and running to meet his disheveled, repentant prodigal as he finally comes home. This father is a picture of our great father. Compassion, running, embracing, kissing our father. Now listen, if the little wheels in your brain are not overheating at this impossible truth, Maybe you still don't get it. At the end of the book of Jude, there's this wonderful, wonderful benediction. And in it he says, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Whose joy? The grammar tells us that it is God's joy. God's joy in you. The Bible tells us God will not experience unmixed joy till the day you are completely holy and happy, sanctified and spotless. And on that day, he's going to present you glorious and perfect before his throne and before the rest of the universe. And the Bible tells us on that day, his joy and his laughter will rock the universe. And on that day, the prophet Zephaniah tells us that he will rejoice over you with singing. That means on that day, he will sing a song over us that will be the greatest song that has ever, ever been heard. It'll be a greater song than the song that the morning stars sang at the birth of time. It's the song everyone in this room longs for and reaches out for in every song they ever hear. We hear tendrils of it sometimes on the very edges of our consciousness. And it is God's song. Every fiber of your being, whether you know it or not, needs that song to be sung over you the great song that calls you home, the greatest love song there ever was. Every musician who has ever composed a song, every singer who has ever sung a song, whether you know it or not, you're reaching out and you're trying to hear the real song, but you won't ever hear it for real and in its fullness until that day. You will never be whole until those notes fall into your heart and the beauty of the thing sinks on you and into you and the joy of God rocks the universe around you because he has bound up his joy with yours. And it gives a whole new light to the truth that the psalmist teaches us in 1611. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Girls, I know I say it all the time, but I have to say it again. One day our minds are going to be blown. We don't understand joy and pleasure right now to anything close to the extent of these true, real, heavenly things because we still see through a glass or a mirror darkly. Our view is hazy and blurred. 
our ears are still largely plugged to get back to the song analogy. But one day, we will hear, we will see, face to face with our impossibly good king, the great love of our lives, though we rarely even have the earthly sense to know it. Now we know in part, then we will know fully, even as we have been fully known. We will burst forth into being the us that we were always meant to be. And I can't even begin to imagine what that day will be like, but oh, how I long for it. One day we will hear his joyful love song, and we will have arrived at the culmination of all human existence. And scripture tells us it will sing with representatives of every people, tribe, nation, and language. Our voice will rise up in a symphony of praise with theirs, our brothers and sisters we haven't met yet. Listen to the way that some of God's singing is described, de, sorry, described in The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. Remember the Christ character who is this lion named Aslan? He is singing over creation. Or better put, he is singing creation, or he is singing out creation. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once. Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth herself. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune. But it was beyond comparison the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. The horse seemed to like it too. He gave the sort of a whinny a horse would give if, after years of being a cab horse, it found itself back in the old field where it had played as a foal and saw someone it remembered and loved coming across the field to bring it a lump of sugar. Ain't it lovely, said the cabbie. Then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up on the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment, there had been nothing but darkness. Next moment, a thousand, thousand points of light leaped out. Single stars, constellations, and planets, brighter and bigger than any in our world. There were no clouds. The new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time, and if you had seen and heard it as Diggory did, you would have felt certain that it was the stars themselves which were singing, and that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. Glory be, said the cabbie, I'd have been a better man all my life if I'd known there were things like this. The voice on the earth was now louder and more triumphant, but the voices in the sky, after singing loudly with it for a time, began to get fainter, and now something else was happening. Far away and down near the horizon, the sky began to turn gray. A light wind, very fresh, began to stir. The sky in that one place grew slowly and steadily paler. You could see shapes of hills standing up dark against it. All the time, the voice went on singing. The eastern sky changed from white to pink and from pink to gold. The voice rose and rose till all the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to the mightiest and the most glorious sound it had yet produced, the sun arose. Diggory had never seen such a sun. You could imagine that it laughed for joy as it came up. And the song in this particular book in the Chronicles of Narnia goes on for pages and pages longer. And if a mere man, albeit with an astounding imagination, can conceptualize God's song to that extent, we simply cannot fathom what the real song will sound like. 
The glass we see through is still too dark. Our ears are still too blocked. But I think often of this verse when I'm trying to stretch my mind to comprehend my God and my bright future with him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7b. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. C.S. Lewis only saw through a glass darkly. And see how beautiful his imagined God song was? Only wait for the real thing, sisters. So what do you do in the meantime? What do we do with all of this? Perhaps you can sing back. Your song can be your amen, just as in the 2 Corinthians passage I referenced earlier. Your song will feel paltry, inadequate, stupid even to your own ears. But perhaps you can ask him to tune your heart to sing his grace as the old hymn phrases it. Can you reorient your life so that it is a living praise song, a sacrifice of praise to your king? Where do the notes of it currently falter or veer off tune? Sometimes my singing is just downright yuck. Perhaps this is because we are yet captives in a foreign land, just like the northern tribes in Assyria, and very shortly in our study, the Judeans in Babylon. Maybe Psalm 137 is perfect for someone like you, someone like me in this plight. In it, the Judeans are sitting by the waters of Babylon, where they sit and they weep. Because remember, weeping is the common plight of people longing for their homeland, but who can't be sure that they'll ever get back there again. The Judeans weeping by the waters of Babylon remember Zion, and they love her. Their captors required of them songs of Zion on command. But God's people just didn't feel like they had it in them to sing. Do you ever feel like this? We're living in occupied territory, spiritually speaking. And so it's no small wonder that you feel like this at times. The prince of the powers of the air wreaks havoc. I once heard a Bible teacher explain it so vividly that though his head is surely crushed, past tense, his tail thrashes yet. What do you do? The thrashing of his tail hurts. It stings, I know. My heart is broken too, sister. What should you do? Sing anyway. Defiantly, bravely, just sing anyway. I know some of you are in the pits of great grief. I don't gloss over it when I tell you to summon the gumption to sing anyway. Who can you minister to as a part of your song? How can you lift your voice up in praise to our Father? You can do it literally and you can do it figuratively. Who needs a meal this week as a part of your sacrifice of praise? In what relationship in your life do you need to stop making negative assumptions and start giving him or her the benefit of the doubt? Remember that in Proverbs it tells us that it is to our glory to overlook an offense. Overlook your offense. How else can you lift up your grateful song to our God in serving a brother or a sister? Who needs your particular music this week? The description of God's holy remnant in Zephaniah is fascinating to me. Let us be these women together. Did you notice that God's call to them is to gather? We forget to gather and we are done for. His holy remnant, then and now, are people who seek refuge in the name of their God. What else do they seek? They seek him, himself, not his gifts. Just the giver. They seek righteousness. They do his just commands. They seek humility. 
They inquire of him. They are not complacent. They don't wear foreign attire. They dress differently than the world around them dresses. What proverbial outfit do you wear of late? Does your outfit too much resemble the foreign attire of the world around you? And you know what else they do? They sing. And their God sings over them and rejoices over them with gladness. God quiets them by his love. God exults over them with his loud singing. He restores their fortune before their eyes. Sing with confident joy and thankfulness today over what you already know that he is going to do tomorrow. Sing it like you believe it because others are going to hear your song as well. Sing figuratively and sing literally. Ask him to be the one to put a new song in your mouth if you need it. Don't be afraid to even sing a little bit about the impending day of God's judgment and wrath. Don't apologize for those songs. Songs can save lives. One day, God willing, we're going to sing his praises with the angels. Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming soon. Let's pray. Father, sometimes I don't even know what to do with the truth of your scripture. Would you help us to know what to do with the truth of your scripture through the pages of Zephaniah? Would you make us, all of us, a part of your holy remnant? Would you make us humble women, righteous women, lowly women, women who inquire of our God all day long, over and over again, praying without ceasing? Would you make us women who seek you? Would you make us women who sing in Jesus' name? Amen. And now just before I let you go, sisters, I have another little benediction for you, if you wish, to look it up on your own. Some of your leaders will have already sent you the link, but if they didn't do it yet, you can open up your very own Bible and Google Psalm 40, Poor Bishop Hooper. They are a band that I've always avoided in the past because I just assumed they were a rap band or something. They're not. They are incredible. Poor Bishop Hooper. Their goal is to write a song for every psalm in the psalm book. So today I want you, as a way to let God's song wash over you, look up Psalm 40 by poor Bishop Hooper and worship along with these good folk. I love you. Have a good week.